thank you for uh, inviting me to uh, to give this uh, webinar, and uh, thanks everybody for coming. Um, so uh, before you know, I get into the uh, the nitty gritties of uh, machine learning. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about how I uh, come to this field, how I learn about machine learning. Um, as uh, Prinkley said, um, after I graduated, I had the uh, um, uh, a chance to join IBM's Human Language Technologies Group, uh, and I stayed there for three years as a research associate. And um, now this group has produced a few distinguished alumnus alumni. Uh, one of them is the co-CEO of Renaissance Technologies, uh, Bob Mercer. Uh, you might have heard of him because he was uh, recently profiled uh, uh, on the New Yorker magazine in the most recent issue. And the title is the reclusive hedge fund tycoon behind the Trump presidency. Uh, so he was actually quite famous recently, but not because of machine learning. The other distinguished alumnus is the other co-CEO of Renaissance Technologies. His name is Peter Brown. And um, well, for those of you who may not have heard of Renaissance Technologies, it is one of the, well, it is widely regarded as the most successful uh, quant fund uh, in the history of the industry. And uh, it had uh, one of the most uh, profitable uh, vehicle, uh, the Medallion Fund, uh, reportedly had uh, uh, been uh, uh, achieving annualized return of, of uh, before fees of 80% year after year for the last 20 years, and never had a down year. Um, and uh, the third distinguished alumnus of my group was David Magerman, who also uh, has uh, joined Rantech in the early days and built out the infrastructure, the trading infrastructure of Renaissance Technologies. And um, now enough about my uh, you know, colleagues who have gone on to become billionaires. Uh, my own system uh, when I was at uh, IBM uh, is a language, uh, is a nat natural language processing system. Uh, that system uh, was submitted to a competition and ranked number seven globally, and the competition was um, uh, was judged by the Defense Advanced uh, Research Project Agency and the Department of Commerce. Um, so after the um, you know, so I I had a very very exciting time at that group, but um, I thought that this since everybody in my group seems to be moving into the finance industry. I thought I might join that too. So, in, but instead of going to Rantech, I uh, went to Morgan Sandy, where they had a group called Artificial Intelligence and Data Mining Group, uh, where we develop, among other things, trading strategies to support um, uh, the, the various trading groups in the firm. Uh, and then after that, some of the people in my group decided to start up our own trading group at Credit Suisse called Horizon Trading Group, and we mainly does equities proprietary trading. So now after all this um, experience both in the high tech as well as in the finance industry, you might have thought that um, I would have been extremely successful in deploying um, AI algorithms in or machine learning algorithms and apply them to trading and would have been making millions uh, after all this experience. And how did it turn out? Well, actually it didn't work out. Uh, I did not succeed at that time in uh, after all this work in applying machine learning in trading. That's a surprise. So, but interestingly, I didn't know why at that time because I was quite shocked that despite being in the best in the field and in the most august of firms, uh, it didn't work. How could that be? So, but now I know the reason, and that is. The goal of this talk is to partly explain the pitfalls of machine learning, why it doesn't work in trading, and how it can work in trading. So, um, let's talk about the pitfalls first. When I first started using machine learning in trading, I had the um, misfortune of thinking that it would work on applying it to daily bars. And I further had the misfortune of thinking that my input should be technical indicators. And finally, I had applied it to futures and index trading, like S&P 500 uh, futures and so forth. 
And all of these are the reasons why they fail. And the reason is that they are in, you know, under these circumstances, the data are simply insufficient for machine learning algorithm. And machine learning will suffer severe data snooping bias when you are applying under these conditions, under these three conditions. In contrast, what do you, what do, what I believe has potential, where I believe machine learning has potential of making a profitable trading strategy is if you apply it to tech data, in particular, if you apply it to all the book data or to fundamental data or, or non-traditional data, that is, for example, news um, uh, or other uh, 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 non-price data. And finally, if you apply it to stocks, individual stocks rather than to futures and indices, uh, where there are many, many uh, choices, um, uh, you know, you, you can, you know, multiply it by 3,000 or 5,000 uh, each at each uh, data bar. You can have a cross-sectional dimension of three to 5,000 stocks that you can apply your algorithm to. And that's um, much more likely you would succeed uh, if you were to apply machine, uh, machine learning to trading. So now, I mentioned that data snooping bias is one of the main uh, impediment impediment to uh, having a successful in machine learning um, algorithm or applying it to trading. And so how do you, in general, overcome it? Now, as I mentioned, you can, of course, get more data, but you can never have enough data in some sense, right? The more data, the merrier. Even if you are using uh, tech data, you could have more of it. So how, you know, given a certain amount of data, uh, you know, and sometimes you may not have tech data as, as, at your disposal, how would you um, overcome this uh, limitation? How would you create more data so that your machine learning algorithm has a better chance of working? And one of the um, most common way of doing so is called uh, resampling. It's a standard statistical technique. Uh, sometimes it's called oversampling. It's actually a better name, it's oversampling. Uh, other names, would be bootstrapping or bagging. And the idea is, is actually quite simple, is what you do is that you would create random data, but with the same statistical distribution as the actual uh, historical data set by sampling these data with replacement. So you would create multiple rows of certain data uh, and mix them in so that uh, uh, apparently you have expanded the data set by a certain factor, but actually a lot of the data rows are repeated. Now that sounds uh, you know, simple uh, and it may sound like cheating to some of you, but it actually works uh, with the caveat that if you are running your machine learning algorithm on uh, time series data, you know, like for example, uh, bar data, uh, which has serial correlation, uh, you have to take care to preserve the serial autocorrelation in time series data. You cannot just say, okay, let me just recreate um, sample five times of today's data and seven times uh, yesterday's data. Well, if your uh, trading algorithm needs the return between yesterday and today, to predict tomorrow's data, uh, you know, just inserting a few uh, lines of data that is, uh, you know, yesterday's data would completely destroy your training strategy because that destroy the serial autocorrelation in the time series data. So there, you you have to be more uh, careful than just blindly, uh, you know, replicating rows in the data set. Now, how you do that is a rather detailed question, which you know probably should be discussed in another context. Um, but just to highlight the fact that resampling is typically one way uh, that we can overcome data snooping bias in the face of a limited data set. Now, in a, a natural language processing parlance, uh, you would be making prediction uh, use, uh, you know, you, to preserve this serial autocorrelation is like in, a, in natural language processing using bigrams or trigrams instead of using single words uh, to predict what the next word is.
uh, that's uh, something that people in the in the uh, uh, machine learning uh, community would be very very familiar with. Uh, you simply just need to uh, in, you know use multiple days as input instead of just a single day at a time uh, in order to preserve this kind of zero autocorrelation. Okay, so um, now there's another way, uh, kind of orthogonal way to reduce data snooping bias besides um, creating more random data, and that is reducing the number of features. That might seem uh, surprising. We, uh, features, by the way, uh, there's another word for it, and that's uh, predictors, right? Or the input to a machine learning algorithm. These are the inputs. Um, Many people would have thought that the more data, the more um, features, the merrier, right? For example, uh, wouldn't if you you can create ten technical indicators, wouldn't it be better than having one technical indicator? Having one thousand uh, or one hundred uh, fundamental input data to to that, that measure a company's uh, financial uh, uh, status, uh, wouldn't that be better than having ten fundamental? Uh, indicators, right? So the you know the the bias, the the common perception, misconception, the common misconception is that the more features and the more predictors are the better. But actually, in trading, feature-rich data set is a curse, and that's not just my own bias. It's not just my own subjective opinion. Uh, Nassim Taleb, whom you might have uh, also known, famous uh, writer, uh, uh, the inventor of the notion of black swan. Um, he already written a article in the magazine in '93. I'm sorry, in '90 uh, in 2013, called "Beware the Big Errors of Big Data." And the same the same point he's making as I do now is that the more features you have, the more likely you will find spurious um, auto correlation between those feature and the and and the and the, uh, the target. So, although we want more data, we do not want more features. The more you have data, the less likely you have data snooping bias. But the more features you have, the more likely you are going to suffer from data snooping bias. So feature selection is critical. We want to reduce the feature set to a small enough set so that you won't suffer from data snooping bias. And fortunately, a lot of machine learning algorithms are designed for doing that. With one exception, very critical exception, neural network and deep learning algorithms isn't one of them. I know that many people are greatly excited by neural net and deep learning. Uh, it's all the rage out there. Uh, uh, you know, Google has been using it to uh, feed it into self-driving car, going into Google Translate, uh, Apple using it for their Siri um, uh, auto assistant. And you know, it seems like everybody else is uh, 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 is uh, using neural network and embedding it into your cell phone, into website. But one thing uh, I I have come to observe is that uh, it has never worked in trading for me. Now, I you know, some somebody else might have been able to make it work, but it never worked for me. And the reason it never worked for me is be, is because neural net and deep learning does not select feature. It basically takes everything you got and then mix and match them and squeeze them into a sausage such that it will force an output out of it and that uh, is not ideal uh, for trading okay so what are the however what are the good machine learning algorithms that does feature selection there are quite a um, uh, quite a lot of uh, 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 well, quite quite a few of these. Uh, I will highlight three of them. One is um, stepwise regression. Stepwise regression, you know, can hardly be called machine learning because it's been well known in statistical circles. You know, quite quite simple. And um, the idea is simply uh, that instead of using all the, uh, you you would uh, pick one feature at a time to see if adding that particular feature will give you a better uh, prediction based on some statistical criteria. Uh, if you want to understand a bit more of it, uh, you can read my book, Machine Learn, Machine Trading, 
or you read my latest blog article. I, I'm sorry, I will tell you my uh, blog at the end of the lecture, but um, I, I will have a little bit more explanation of that. But essentially, it's simply it's like the ordinary multiple regression, except that you don't throw in all the features at a time. You add one feature at a time uh, until the algorithm tells you that it can improve your predictability further, and then you start pulling out one feature at a time. The goal is to find a minimal set of predictors in your linear regression. Okay, so um, so yes, yeah, so the other one uh, is uh, is called classical uh, classification and the regression trees, uh, CART. Um, so I will show you a little a diagram of what the card is, but it is somewhat similar to um, uh, sidewise regression, except that it is uh, there is a lot of um, uh, conditionals. Uh, in you know, in, in terms of classification, uh, it doesn't ap apply all the regressors on an equal footing. Uh, instead, it applied in a hierarchical manner uh, with uh, conditions. Uh, Imposed at every iteration. Now it is easier to see what it is than to explain what it is. So I will show you a picture later on. Uh, the third uh, feature selection algorithm is called random forest. Um, random forest is not a particular um, uh, uh, classific al classification algorithm, but it is a technique that you can apply to multiple different classification algorithms. The idea is that it will combine bagging, which, as I mentioned, is the resampling or oversampling of data, with another technique called random subspace, which is the resampling of predictors, but it is in this case undersampled. Okay, so as I said, you want to have a lot of data but a very few predictors. So random forest achieve that by re oversampling data, but undersampling predictors. And again, I uh, I think it would be probably best explained if we can have a table, which I will show you later on. So the table is here. Uh, when I talk about data and features, uh, I'm thinking of a two-dimensional table. Okay, we arrange the 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 data in a two-dimensional array where the rows are individual samples that you input into the learning algorithm, and the columns are the predictors. So. Uh, the, the, for example, for random forest, uh, you would replicate rows by oversampling them with replacement. But for the columns, you would undersample them, still with replacement. But you won't sample all of them. You undersample them. So here is, a, for example, a, a sample table in the next um, slide. Uh, here is, for example, uh, a bunch of data that purports to predict tomorrow's return. Right, so the first column is our target variable. It is tomorrow's returns. That's what we want to predict. And we may have uh, five features. Uh, one of them is simply today's weather. Uh, the second feature might be today's volatility. The third feature might be the today's return. Okay, and the fourth feature might be the sentiment that is perhaps captured by some. Um, and some other algorithm to determine you know, whether it's the sentiment today is bullish or bearish by reading the news, let's say. And then finally, uh, let's say the fifth feature is whether the US dollar uh, index is up or down. Okay, So these are per perfectly hypothetical, uh, five possible features. And all these five features are used to predict the tomorrow's return, which is the first column. So in, in a random forest uh, algorithm, uh, you want to oversample the rows. So you might suddenly say, OK, uh, let us uh, create two of these rows, create five of that row, and create another row, uh, a, a 10 of these rows, and then mix them up. OK, so instead of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine call, uh, rows, you might have 30 rows, where some of the rows might be replicated, duplicated, or triplicated, and so forth. This is of what we mean by oversampling uh, data, creating more rows. At the same time, we would say that, okay, um, 
there are too many features. We don't want to have five features. Some of these might be useless because I have no idea if the weather is a good feature. I have no idea whether the US dollar index is a good feature. How would I know? I only know that these are the, the input I have, but I have no idea if they're useful or not. So you would apply uh, one of these classification algorithms, whether, it, whether it's stepwise regression or whether it is um, classification or regression tree or whatnot, and undersample them. So you might randomly pick, okay, let's try just feature one and feature three. Or let's say we just pick feature two and feature four and see if by undersampling the feature, you get as good a predictability. At that way, you can reduce the feature set. That's another way that that is uh, part of the job of a uh, random forest um, a technique in reducing feature set uh, and reducing data uh, souping bias. Okay, so uh, there's a question. What about using mutual uh, information? Certainly, there are many more techniques, and mutual information is uh, you know another good one. Uh, I will. Uh, uh, I haven't used it too much myself. I used to have uh, done some work with it, but certainly uh, not recently. But yes, I'm by no means uh, I, 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 am I suggesting that the technique I describe are exhaustive. There are there are many more, as as some of you have pointed out, uh, mutual information. And um, there's if you go to my blog, um, there's a guy who commented uh, and he suggested another technique, which I have. Um, Forgotten the name right now, but if you read the comment, there's another technique for reducing um, data streaming bias that was mentioned. And I'm going to look. I will. Uh, I promise him that I will look into it, but I haven't done that yet. So there are many indeed techniques for doing that. These are, however, the most I think uh, simple and well known. Um, okay, so going back to uh, um, one of the um, uh, classification classification algorithm, the feature selection algorithm that I talk about, which is a classification, um, classification tree in particular. So um, let's say we have taken, uh, done the work of resampling the data, oversampling the data, and, uh, and uh, uh, perhaps we have narrowed down the set of features, we can apply the classifier. And one of the classifiers that we can apply to is the classification and regression tree. So in an example of this technique, classification technique, would be trying to find out what values of a technical indicators, for, well, first of all, find out which technical indicators would be useful, and secondly, for those technical indicators that we find are useful, what values of them will generate positive and ne or negative SPY future one-day return. So again, I have described that in the book, but let me give a picture of how the classification uh, of the card uh, uh, algorithm works. So this x1 and x2 and so forth in the picture are simply representative of the predictors. They might be again volatility, it might be um, sentiment uh, uh, going from 0 to 1, it could be uh, one day return. You know, in this case it's probably x2 is probably two day return and x1 is the past one day return. So when the algorithm first run it decided that the two day return is the most predictive. That's why the top node is a it pick x2 is the past two day return is the most useful in predicting the future one day return of SPY. And it decided that uh, if the two day return is less than this number, and this number is picked by the algorithm itself, uh, we can further investigate it. And if the two day return is greater than this number, uh, it will give it will generate a negative return. So immediately it gives you a conclusion. It, it believes that most of the time, if the two-day return is greater than 1.5%, the future one-day return will be negative. But if it is less than 1.5, well, we will have to apply more rules. So it created a subset of the data. So it classifies some data based on this first variable, and then it re redo everything. It's trying to see, again, what other variable can give us a better classification. And at this time, it picks the one-day return. It decided that if one-day return is negative, uh, it has a statistically significant subset. And then we will look into it further by, again, reiterating the algorithm. So again, I'm not you know, going to have time to describe the detail of this uh, algorithm, but this is a you know, typical 
way how machine learning algorithm would work in terms of automatically finding the predictive variables and then automatically finding the parameters that it would be useful for the classifier and then iterate until it finds no statistical significance. So machine learning algorithm oftentimes is essentially a glorified um, uh, statistical regression system. It's just more trees and turns, more, more, more um, uh, uh, details than a, a simple uh, regression or simple daily time series analysis. It has a lot of uh, conditions that it imposes on the data to cut the data into smaller and smaller subset where predictive uh, that, that, that your variable can be more and more predictive. So there's a question uh, already and it's um, Christoph asks if you use price data from the uh, lower TF uh, you have kind of unlimited data. How does that apply to unlimited price data? Uh, I actually don't quite understand what this question is. <laughs> Maybe you can rephrase it. Anyway, uh, I'll, I'll let you, uh, you know, rephrase it uh, because I, I, I don't quite understand what, what the, what the question is. Um, anyway, so another classification algorithm. So th this is a classification tree. Another uh, a very common classical algorithm. Uh, is the support vector machines. So uh, again, the problem is to predict uh, what the future uh, one day SPY return is, uh, whether it's positive or negative. And again, you can uh, use uh, technical indicators as um, uh, as uh, as the input. Um, the in this case for support vector machines, classification is is based on finding a hyperplane. Uh, to cut through the data so that data that, for example, belong to the uh, future one day positive return will sit on one side of the hyperplane and, da uh, and uh, data that represent uh, negative one day return will be sitting on the other side. So we are looking for this hyperplane so that we can cut the data into half. And if we can do that, we will know very well under what condition do we most likely find a positive one day return tomorrow and under what condition we would find a negative one day uh, return tomorrow. Now, that's the simplification, that's a simplified picture uh, uh, of the data. But of course, most often times, there is no such hyperplane that is so easy to cut the data into half and all the uh, classes, uh, the positive return uh, uh, samples is on one side and the negative return uh, data is on the other side. It's, life is never so perfect. So oftentimes you have to actually apply a nonlinear transformation to the data, uh, transform it through what is called a kernel function so that you can apply such a hyperplane. Uh, I, this, high, this kernel function can be a Gaussian function, can be a sigmoidal function, can be a polynomial function, but the idea is that after you transform it, uh, then this data, which originally cannot be separated, will suddenly be able to separate. Okay, it's, it's, it, it, it has a topological transformation of these data points so that they, be, they were able to separate by a hyperplane. Or another way to look at it is that instead of using a hyperplane to cut through the data, you will have to use a uh, rubber sheet of some in some high dimension, and you will be able to separate the data. Uh, so there are two ways to look at it. But this nonlinear transformation, or called kernel transformation, is critical to making a support vector machine work. But before, you know, without going to the details, this is the simple picture of how a SVM is supposed to work. Supposing that all the positive return days is on one side, all the negative return days are on the other side, if you can find a plane, uh, that can separate them, and the, the x and the y axis, by the way, uh, represent the predictors. So in this case, we only have two predictors. But if you have, you know, n predictors, you will be dealing with a n-dimensional space, right? So that's why we are talking about hyperplane. But in the two-dimensional space with two predictors x and y, you can see that if you can find this hyperplane, that means that for a certain x and y inequality, you know, x greater than uh, a times y plus b, you know, that will typically 
give you negative return. And if x is uh, less than a times y plus b, you will typically get positive return. So that's a simplistic way of understanding a support vector machine. But that's yet another way of classifying data. So before I go on, let me look at some um, some questions. Uh, yes. So so. Um, Yes, so Crystal said, uh, I, we need to resample because we don't have enough data. That is uh, correct. Uh, from price data, from a time frame like min, min, one minute, you can have lots of data. Now, maybe, well, it depends on, again, uh, how many predictors you have. You know, one minute might seem like there's a lot of data, but a lot of that data might be correlated. Uh, so, it, you know, it might not actually offer a lot of um, uh, enough data for the machine learning algorithm to learn. And particularly if you have a lot of predictors, um, you would need more data uh, in order to uh, increase the statistical significance. So whether or not one has enough data is a relative uh, uh, judgment. It is really relative to how many predictors you have, right? So you might think that uh, if you have only a couple of predictors, uh, yes, one, if you have one minute data, you may not need to resample. That is true. You might not uh, need to. You can just use the raw data as an input. Um, now, support a vector machine. Uh, I would uh, uh, consider it uh, of a less of a um, uh, classification algorithm. Uh, if, I'm sorry, less of a feature selection algorithm than um, uh, stepwise regression uh, or classification tree. And, uh, the, uh, and the only reason is that the input are all used up, right? So you are trying to find a hyperplane uh, that cut into any dimension, and the dimension is not reduced, right? The dimension of the hyperspace is equal to the number of uh, predictors that you are entering. So, uh, you know, the algorithm doesn't automatically get rid of some dimensions for you. You are trying to do the best you can in transforming the data and finding a hyper hyperplane that can cut through the data in that fixed dimension. So once you fix the dimension, it is uh, less of a, a feature uh, selection algorithm. So, uh, you know, of course, we can talk a little bit more about it if we have time in, in the end. But uh, in my view, uh, SVM is, is less of a uh, feature selection algorithm than the other two, uh, namely the stepwise regression and the classification and regression tree. So, uh, okay, let me move on a little bit. Uh, okay, so now uh, I mentioned that neural network I have never been a big fan of in trading, but let me mention what it is because it's been all the rage. Neural network is essentially a non-linear regression. We talk a lot about regression, whether it's stepwise regression or regression tree or even SVM, you can think of it as a kind of regression, although it's transformed, but neural network is definitely a kind of non-linear regression. Uh, now, what is the difference between neural network and deep learning? Well, deep learning is simply a neural network with many layers, but very few nodes per layer. It has been found that by adding more layers, but for having fewer nodes actually is easier to capture for the for the um, for the network to capture uh, features in stages. Okay, um, I'm no expert in that, so uh, that's all I can tell you what the <laughs> deep learning is. Um, but the central idea of the nonlinear regression is that you fit a monster nonlinear function instead of using a linear function as in regression model, but you fit a nonlinear function to data. And the nonlinear function is why I call it monster is because it's an iterated function. You started with a sigmoidal function, which is already nonlinear. A sigmoidal function is one over one plus e to the minus x. It looks like an S. That's why it's called sigmoidal. Uh, and you iterate them by, by iterating, I mean, functional composition. You feed sums of the sigmoidal function into another sigmoidal function, and then you do that again and again. That become a network. So here is an uh, is a picture of it. So you might have uh, four input, x1 to x4, okay? And uh, you feed them into the, um, uh, you sum them, and then you take the sum 
as an input to the sigmoidal function. And you do that again uh, on the next node. So you can have multiple nodes. Each node will have a different weighting uh, method of weighting these inputs. And uh, you might have a different uh, parameter to the sigmoidal function. And you do that uh, with as many nodes as you like. And then for each node, you have an output. And this output is feed into another layer of of these um, of the neural network, and which is again summing with different weights and different parameters of the sigmoidal function, and so on. So you can see that this function is what I call a monster nonlinear regression function because it's so complicated, it has so many sum, but it can it can be proven that if you build a complicated enough network, you can approximate any nonlinear function. And so, in a sense, that's the power of neural network. Whatever is the causal, is the mathematical relationship between the input and the output, right? So, input might be yesterday's return, two days' return, volatility, and whatnot, and output might be tomorrow's return. So, whatever unknown mathematical relationship is between these past, these predictors and the target variable, the neural network can approximate it. And supposedly, you know, if you feed in a new input, like today, suddenly the volatility goes to two percent, and uh, however the return is uh, minus three, uh, you can just as well predict a new uh, return for tomorrow. Sounds great, right? This is this is sounds like powerful. You know, it's like magic. You train the network on past data, and it can precisely tell you uh, what exactly you should expect is tomorrow's return given today's variable. You can have 100 variable that you fit in. Well, that is, sounds great in theory, and it works very well in those situations where the data is stationary. For example, it works very well in self-driving car. It works very well in computer vision. It works very well in uh, natural language understanding, in speech recognition, in machine translation. That's why people are using it. But it doesn't work in trading. Why doesn't it work in trading? It doesn't work in trading is because there are the, 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 the financial market is not stationary. You cannot learn everything by just feeding in as complicated data as, as, as you like. For example, you can feed in the position of Mars relative to the Earth, the position of the Moon relative to the Earth, the temperature uh, of uh, New York, the temperature of London, and uh, you know the weather is sunny or, or cloudy. And you know you can have as many variables as you like, and the neural network is going to fit exactly to that. It it find that, for example, you could find that uh, in the on Black Monday in 1987, uh, the day could be um, 27, uh, you know, degree Fahrenheit. It could be sunny, and it thinks that whenever this temperature and this weather prevails, and when the volatility is is low or high, it will produce a crash. Well, that doesn't work because it, you can never, you know, have the insight to capture the relevant features rather than capturing this trivial accidental feature. And that's why uh, it is very difficult to make a neural net in particular, or even even deep learning network to work in finances because um, the data is non-stationary. There is no particular causal effect with a lot of variables with the market. There may be some variables that are very causal, but it is very hard to find them uh, using this approach of a neural network approach. Because as you can see, the problem with the neural network is that it uses all the input. It never skips anything. It doesn't select the features. OK, so um, let me see if there are any uh, questions so far before I move on. Uh, okay. All right. Um, there are some people who have raised their hands. I don't know if they have questions because if you have questions, you could just uh, type into the uh, uh, Q and A uh, box. Uh, you don't actually have to raise hand to to ask the question. Um, I assume that uh, GoPro is, um, uh, has a question. So I will pause for a minute. Let 
is backtrack one tap. Ah, yes, okay. Uh, well, I maybe I'll uh, answer some of the question later because I don't see any uh, any question showing up on the Q and A box. So, anyway, so let me wrap up. Anyway, uh, this is almost the end. So, when will a machine learning be useful to traders? Uh, that's it's useful if you don't have intuition about your data or you don't have intuition about the market. Okay. Uh, and or if you don't have a mathematical model of your data, when I say mathematical model, it could be very simple, uh, such as um, um, a mean reversion model or a trending model, or a um, um, in the case of uh, let's say um, uh, you believe that the uh, S, uh, the the stock market is uh, is uh, is driven by three factors, so that would be a simple mathematical model, right? Or you might. Um, uh, uh, you might uh, uh, think that uh, um, uh, let's say you are talking about uh, trying to uh, predict stocks return. Again, you might have a simple uh, three-factor model. So these are simple mathematical models. But in some cases, you might not have this model. You don't know how to find them, or you don't have a good intuition. You don't know if the uh, this price series is mean voting, retrending, or if uh, how 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 one can trade it. Well, that's when uh, machine learning can help you to develop some of the intuition. If not to be the final trading model, at least it can give you some intuition, right? I might find out that certain predictors are useful, and then you can drill down on them uh, by other methods. Uh, sometimes also you have too many features. Right, that, that you are you have uh, suffering the curse of uh, dimensionality. Uh, like for example, you are presented with a um, financial statement of a company. You might have uh, 50 fields. Is is the revenue important? Is the earnings important, or is it the dividend that's important? We don't know. Right, it's, uh, you you know you may not be a, um, a charter financial analyst and. You just want to use this to trade, so that if you have too many features and don't know which ones are important, you can certainly apply machine learning algorithm to help you to narrow down the features. Uh, if, on the other hand, you have, if these are not true, if you have good intuition, if you have a good simple mathematical model of your of, of your market, you are better off building simple models rather than using machine learning. Okay, so. Um, now, when will machine learning be useless? As I pointed out, if you have too little data, let's say you have only daily data, okay, uh, daily data on futures, okay, that's not sufficient. Uh, and the second uh, situation is when I mentioned that when you have regime changes very often, let's say, uh, you know, if you are feeding data in since 2009, it will all be bull market. The machine learning algorithm thought that the stock market always goes up, right? That's hardly a particularly smart application of machine learning. If it thinks that all you need to do is to long SPY, you don't have to do anything, just long, okay? Buy on dip, that's it. Uh, similarly, if your market has been volatile versus placid, again, if you train it on the market since 2009, most of the time it's uh, very placid. Uh, you think that shorting volatility will be good, so it's just every day you short VXX, that's about it. Uh, that's the most profitable algorithm, right? Uh, similarly, trending versus mean inverting, growth uh, versus value, low versus high interest rate or inflation. One has to make sure that your algorithm can is actually learning from different kind of regimes rather than just learning from one regime. And if because otherwise, whenever there's a regime change, your machine learning algorithm will completely fall apart because if it's, it's a bull market model, all it will do is to long SPY, and you know when the market suddenly turns bearish, it doesn't work anymore. So again, that relates to our notion of non-stationary statistics, and that is when uh, just I'm going to elaborate on that uh, in addressing some of the questions. Uh, when the statistics are non-stationary, uh, no statistical algorithm can learn from it uh, because uh, you know it's it's 
actually no one can learn from it unless you are able to extract features that are stationary. So if you feed in non-stationary data to a learner, obviously garbage in and garbage out, you could not possibly learn anything uh, that is going to be of value out of sample. Okay, So that's the uh, times then machine learning are not useful. Um, anyway, so uh, I have explained some of these points and other uh, details further in my book, uh, Machine Trading. Uh, and uh, I will explain some of this again further in my May workshop on artificial intelligence techniques for traders. Um, you can visit my website, epchan.com. Uh, and I also uh, have elaborated on some of these examples on my blog, epchan.blogspot.com. Uh, and I oftentimes uh, treat articles, uh, links that are of interest to uh, trading and machine learning and so forth uh, at my, uh, at my uh, Twitter handle. Uh, Chen Yip. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Let me go through some of these questions um, uh, and see um, if I can answer them. So, um, so Christoph uh, uh, suggests that to avoid non-stationarity, we can um, predict, uh, you know, to apply stationarity tests. Well. That is in a very narrow sense of stationarity, right? So the stationarity I think you are thinking of is um, whether uh, the, the data is doing a random walk or whether it's mean reverting. That's the sense of stationarity I think that you're thinking. But I'm, when I mention stationarity here, it is in a, uh, it's a more general sense of statistical stationarity. It doesn't necessarily mean that uh, it is uh, mean reverting. It doesn't mean that it is uh, uh, integrated of order uh, zero uh, in technical terms. It actually means that the statistical characteristics of this time series uh, remain unchanged. And uh, well, yes, there are statistical tests that you can test to see if the statistical characteristics is unchanged, but oftentimes um, the result is uh, ambiguous. Uh, it, it's, it's actually quite difficult to, uh, to be absolutely certain that the there's no regime change. You know, it's, it's, it's not a, 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 a simple technical matter uh, oftentimes. It's, there's a lot of ambiguity there. It's, it's a really hit upon the, the problem of the, um, um, the limitation of uh, uh, limited data statistics. Uh, OK, so there's a question about Gopo from Gopo saying, uh, there's work being done on reinforcement learning. Um, OK, so I think that uh, I'm missing part of it. Uh, that is, is that effective as opposed to traditional deep learning? Now, I, I have, um, uh, I'm no, first of all, let me say I'm no expert in reinforcement learning, deep learning, and deep Q networks and whatnot. Uh, and the reason is that whenever I look at a article, okay, um, I used to be uh, quite diligent in replicating this method. Whenever I read an article that suggests that some of these machine learning methods uh, work, uh, and I try to replicate the result, and it never work out of sample. So I have stopped doing that. Uh, you know, I, I want to save my time. So when you ask me, okay, is this effective or not, I can tell you I don't know, but I'm deeply skeptical because when I was still diligently replicating the results of these people, I have never found anyone uh, that uh, has any relationship to neural network to work out of sample. Uh, so that's why I stopped doing it. So Sparst, you know, uh, say, uh, yes, linear regression is better than neural net. In some sense, that is true. But, you know, I would say that perhaps a little bit uh, of um, more clever use of linear regression as in uh, stepwise regression or as in um, classification regression tree, though, those might still be okay. Uh, you know, because it's, uh, it's you know, at that, it does feature selection for you at the very least. Right? Because just because we are using linear regression does not avoid data snooping bias. Because if you have 100 um, inputs, okay, and you run a multiple regression on them, you will still get data snooping bias. The question is, how do you reduce that 100 input to a small number that's really predictive? And that um, old-fashioned linear regression won't do it for you. Okay, so... Um, Bruce said, I have not discussed uh, what the target function may be. Indeed, it can, it, it, the target function is uh, to be customized to your particular uh, trading strategy. 
sometimes you want to predict uh, next day return of SPY. Other times you want to predict um, the one month return of a particular stock. So it is really up to you to be you to choose the particular target function. Now, um, of course, uh, in the you are you know we are limited by data. As I say, if you want to predict one month return, uh, most likely you are we are stuck with daily data. This is unlikely that the minute data will have any signal uh, useful for predicting one month return. So if you're going to have a target function that is one month return, well, that means that we are stuck with daily return as the input and therefore we are limited by the amount of data we can get. Uh, if, however, you have a target function that is one minute return, now maybe we, we can apply machine learning better using all the book data and whatnot. So, so the so the target function selection uh, is tied with you know how much data we can get in in the predictor because you don't you don't want to use a you don't want to have a big mismatch between the time scale of the target function at uh, the target variable and the predictor variable. Um, so Quan said, what are the underlying difference uh, between other ML methods and deep learning? So one will be other, but the other doesn't. Well, the underlying difference is mainly, uh, in my view, uh, that um, the other methods use feature selection, and deep learning and neural network does less good a job in feature selection. And I view feature selection as one of the most critical uh, functions that a machine learning algorithm can do. Okay, it's not really how well it fit the predict the, the relationship between predictor and uh, and the target variable. That's neural network does very well. It fit a perfect function. The relationship between the predictor and the future, it can fit perfectly, but that's not what we want. We don't want it to fit perfectly. We want it to select those variables that has high statistical significance instead of fitting it to the past perfectly. Uh, what some of the, uh, when you say measure algorithm, you, I think you mean uh, quantix uh, statistical significance. Uh, typically, one can use um, AIC criteria, BIC criteria, those things that measure the likelihood, but penalized by the number of predictors. So, you know, if your data is noisy, uh, your maximum likelihood will be, uh, your likelihood function will be lower, and if you have a lot of predictors, your likelihood function will, uh, your, your BIC or AIC criterion will be actually um, uh, larger, right? So, so it's, it's, there's a minus sign there. But anyway, uh, likelihood and uh, the pen, pen penalty for predictors would be what we judge uh, as to how good an algorithm is, is in predicting uh, the future. Um, so Christoph said, can I give an example of a target? Well, that's, the, um, as I said, it's, uh, a, it could be as simple as to, tomorrow's return of the SPY, right? So let's say you want to predict how the market index move. So that would be an example, one day uh, return of the SPY variable. Um, Quandex asks also, how do you define regime over the course of a long period? Um, no, uh, there are many ways to define regime, right? So, you, you know, everybody have their own favorite regime. I give some examples. Uh, it could be a volatile versus a placid regime. And how do you cut off? Well, maybe you can say fix greater than 20 is volatile. Fix under tw uh, 20 is not volatile, it's placid. Or you can say bull or bear market. Well, there are probably definition out there which is a, you know, if you are, um, have a certain number of days in the drawdown, you will be a bear market and so forth. So uh, you, the, the regime definition by itself is also arbitrary, right? So the question, you know, we, we kind of intuitively understand what it is, but, but, um, uh, but uh, you know, it's not, uh, uh, no, no two person can exactly agree on what that regime is. And whatever they can agree on is arbitrary anyway. So, but the idea uh, is intuitively obvious that uh, if you are going to run your algorithm only on bull, bullish regime, uh, it's not likely to do a very good job in the bear market. Right. Okay, so I think that um, uh, we are almost out of time. So let me just quickly go through the rest of it. 
how many trades in your opinion it works um, it's not a question of how many trades um, it is a, a question of um, um, well let me think about the, 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 this question um, effectively you are talking about you know you have a uh, expected return and uh, you want to find the error in the expectation and so the error typically is proportional to the square root of the number of trades so uh, you know effectively uh, if you want to have a high um, accuracy in predicting return uh, you have to reduce your uh, n or especially re re reducing the square root of n to a manageable number and Fortunately, sharp ratio is one example of how we can measure it. So if you have a, a strategy that has a high sharp ratio, we can say uh, that it works, right? A sharp ratio of two or greater than two is, is a strategy that works, you can say. And sharp ratio is actually a very good measure of statistical significance because it incorporates the concept of the square root of n uh, in, the, in the construction. So, um, Okay, I think that um, there's, um, you know, I think the last question uh, that Christoph has is uh, is a bit too technical, and uh, frankly, I I have not um, studied the particular algorithm that you you um, uh, you mentioned, so I won't be able to offer much insight to that, uh, and I think it's uh, rather uh, you know, perhaps too technical for this very. High